Michelle, I don't know if you, you can interrupt me at any time, if you can see it, or I can just try to figure out how to get back there at the end. But I don't want anyone to think that I am ignoring you. It's just my lack of ability to navigate this computer. That's fine. So I'll just jump in. If I see questions come through, I'll jump in and um, just kind of uh, stop you as you go. OK. Can, can I, is, is there anybody that does not see my screen? I just clicked another button. I want to make sure I didn't lose everybody. OK, great. I'm going to take silence as I did not mess anything up. And I want to echo Michelle's thank you for coming here. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today are just a couple things on how to do some different stuff in the classroom uh, as it relates to communication, as it relates to the syllabus, as it relates to learning tools outside the box. And I don't uh, sit here or stand here and profess to be any smarter or know any more than anyone else on the call or anyone that was at the presentation or anyone that will see this webinar at a future date. Uh, in fact, I don't think there is much original thought in this presentation at all. I simply collected uh, what I thought were the best of the best from people that I have dealt with over the course of time. I am a lawyer, so some of that comes from judges, some of it comes from other attorneys, some of it comes from uh, teachers or professors that I've had during my collegiate career, and some of it uh, may have come from you, my peers. Uh, I try to uh, use my uh, features accordingly. I have two ears and one mouth, so I try to listen twice as much as I talk. So hopefully these things I share with you will, will help you if they're um, rudimentary, uh, maybe they're just a reminder, but I just wanted to start by saying thank you for being here and uh, to tell you what we're doing. So Twenge 12 Angry Students, I came up with this name because uh, I really wanted to get a chance to present at the SPC uh, function, and it seemed like it was a catchy title and it was success. Uh, I think I got selected based on the title alone, so you guys took a big risk with me. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, Socrates said a long time ago, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm sure he didn't say it exactly this way, but if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. And I think as professors, I'm an adjunct, and it's so easy to fall into the way that we've always done things. It just really, really is. And I think that's human nature. And, you know, you're autonomous in your classroom, and I hope this presentation inspires you a little bit to challenge yourself. Uh, when I do things, I always think it's perfect. Uh, other people have uh, varying opinions. But uh, I think we need some of that constructive feedback sometimes. And based on the way we're set up, the autonomy we have in the classroom, I don't think we get a lot of good candid feedback. So I think the challenge for us as professors and instructors is to really challenge ourselves and try to step outside of our, our mind's eye and look at things objectively. So keep that, that thought in mind. Uh, if we, we do the same thing for 10 years, we're likely getting the same result. And maybe that's a great result, but I challenge you to find ways to always make it better and change with the times. So defendant exhibit A, we have students. We all have students. We deal with students. And I've categorized some of them. This is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek analysis, so please don't be offended. Uh, the first one that, that I see often in class is the angry student. Uh, their natural habitat are the core curriculum and Gordon Rule courses. Um, I teach a core curriculum course, which happens, also happens to be a Gordon Rule course. So I see a lot of these students often, and they exhibit behaviors such as they don't want to be there, they don't like me, uh, they don't like what I stand for, and they don't like what I represent. And the hashtag to be with social media is we don't need no education. So I'm, I'm sure uh, all of you have encountered, uh, been exposed to an angry student at one point or another in your career if you've ever stood in front of a class. Uh, the second category, and I apologize for the mess here, um, I'm using an Apple, and I think I tried to convite this, convert this to PowerPoint, so uh, it's a little bit messy. But the second one is the critical student. And if we were doing this live, I, I would ask show of hands how many have seen these, but I can't see you, so I'll just keep rolling. Um, their habitat is, is more specialized. They're, they're usually associated with specific fields of study. They do uh, wander into the core and curriculum classes because they have to be there. Uh, these students consider themselves intelligent. Uh, and as I was in my late teens and early 20s, I was smarter than everybody in the world, including the professors. So uh, these creatures, uh, these students also often have that same trait. They challenge everything you have to say, no matter how small, with the intent of proving their superior intellect. And I've lovingly deemed these students as hashtag, I love to argue. The third category is the uninformed student. Uh, they, they inhabit all sorts of uh, courses. And their known behaviors are they don't have all the facts. They're not clear on expectations. And the hashtag for them is, you never told us that. And 
you know, I'm going to challenge folks to challenge themselves. If you encounter this particular student frequently, you probably should take a, take a look at what you're doing. And I'm not saying it's all on us as the professors, but you know, a lot of times if we get the same type of reaction from folks and a lot of people are confused, uh, you know, I wholeheartedly believe that I go to work every day and try to do my best. I'm sure every single one of you go to work today, every single day and try to do your best. And you know what, if there's a gap in it and we need to fix it, I think that's where we need to open ourselves up to feedback. But I have encountered many the uninformed student, and I will say with confidence that not all of the uninformed students are a result of my inability to communicate things. Some students just are perpetually uninformed, but uh, we've all dealt with those folks in the classroom. And the last one, this is our ally. Ladies and gentlemen, meet the sympathetic student. They are in all courses. Um, they're the front row sitters. They're the pleasers. They root for you. They're rooting for the professor. And a lot of us don't like to admit it. I certainly don't like to admit it. But there have been times where, you know, early in my career, the first couple times I taught as an adjunct, I didn't have any experience teaching. And I stood up there. And when things started going south, there were those students in the front. And you could see it in their eyes. They were rooting for you. They wanted to cover for you. They wanted to help you. They wanted you to succeed. So these students, hashtag team professor, are very valuable in your course. So those are, that's, a, again, a tongue-in-cheek. And, you know, students do cross different, different uh, types. Uh, I just did that for general amusement. But to also point out, there are specific struggles that students come to class with. So the next set uh, of slides I want to talk about are what I've affectionately labeled as Defendants Exhibit B, staying in the theme, uh, Instructor to Student Communication Practices. Now, please, folks, remember what I said at the beginning here. I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence. Some of this may be very rudimentary. You may roll your eyes at this. But these are things that I've learned and heard throughout the course of my career that I, I found to be effective, and I try to implement them as frequently as possible. So the first slide here is just a basic uh, communication chart. And I'm not going to go over this in detail, but you know, if you're getting a lot of feedback from students and you're, you're struggling with certain things or your students are struggling with certain things, you know, sometimes we have to break things back down to the basics. You know, if I call them $75 words, as a lawyer, I've got all sorts of words that I deem useless because no one understands them. So I sound important and I sound fancy when I use these big expensive words, but isn't the goal of me as a communicator sending for the receiver to understand it? So think about that for a minute. When, when you're, you know, there, there's, you want to aim high and you want your students to use the right vocabulary. But if you jump from entry level core uh, vocabulary up to, you know, PhD level vocabulary, you may be setting students up for a bit of failure. So I'm not saying to drop your expectations so low that you're using a, a fifth grade vernacular, but, but I do say be careful of the communication and think about is, my, is the receiver, is the audience going to understand what I'm delivering here? And this goes for writing, for speaking, for all sorts of mediums. And you know, folks that become really educated, there's so many people that are, that are doctors, PhDs, have advanced degrees. I think we've become accustomed to performing at a certain level and communicating at a certain level. And all I'm asking you to do is kind of look over your materials, look over your lessons plans, look over the things and the methods that you're communicating and think, if it was my first day in college, is this just too much? Because the last thing we want to do as professors, as communicate, people who are communicating knowledge to young folks, is we don't want to set them up for failure. And we don't want to put them in a position where they just feel lost and they get turned off by education. So again, healthy dose of skepticism here. If you're in an advanced level course, if you're teaching a fourth year or you know. Uh, a senior level or a junior level, of course, you're going to have some incremental gain in vocabulary, but just take a, take a quick look and always think about what you're saying and focus on the goal. I tell people, people come to my office and say, oh, I need to write a living will, and I want this and this and this, and they write all this crazy stuff down in this medical language, and I said, you know what? You have to hand that to a doctor, and that physician has to understand exactly what you're asking. Do you think your physician's going to understand that? And then the proverbial light bulb pops up. And I said, just write it as if you were talking to your doctor, telling them what your wishes are. 
And I subscribe that that maps right over to us teaching, taught to the students in a way that they can understand it. All right, the lecture. This, this is when I do this, uh, this, this presentation and I'm in front of people. This is where people start looking at me and thinking, who is this guy? And wow, he is out there. And I, I start uh, getting angry death threats. So lecture, this is what we've always done. It's one-way communication. It's a very passive experience for students. Every single person that is listening to this webinar or is on the phone right now has been through a lot of classes. And I think if we're honest with, with ourselves, if you have sat through a class for more than 60 minutes, you know that at some point in time, if someone's lecturing, you check out. You do, I, I mean, you check out. And I think that's human nature. Uh, we can try as much as we want to stay engaged, but when we are not engaged by, uh, actively engaged, and we're just asking students to sit there quietly while we talk at them for 60 minutes, an hour and a half, whatever the length of time, I, I think the great messages that all the professors are sending are getting lost because the, the human mind can only take so much uh, of someone lecturing. One of the problems with lectures, it requires strong public speaking skills. Look, the material has to, the material is tough, guys. A lot of the things we talk about, I talk about ethics. Now, if that's not a sleeper in the book, I don't know what it is. The folks that made the book did a really good job trying to make it exciting. But, you know, some subjects are just not riveting. They're not sexy. They're not things people are dying to hear about. So it really relies on you and I, the folks delivering this material, to have exceptionally strong public speaking skills. Uh, I'm not saying this isn't a valuable teaching tool, it still is. So this is where people start to ease up and don't hate me or I think I'm totally crazy. Lecturing is a great tool, but I think we have to use it, um, we have to strike a balance. It has to be used as one of the many methods. Uh, I'm gonna take a quick pause here so I can uh, wet my whistle. Michelle, I, again, I can't see. Are there any questions on what we covered thus far? And actually, a presenter told me years ago, I should say, what questions do you have? Uh, no questions. If there are none, I'll just... Oh, uh, okay. And there's no one typing in, so you're good. Okay. So these are some of the things I told you at the beginning that not a lot of original thought here. A lot of this stuff, or actually all of it, are things that I've learned from other people. So... How do you engage the students? We've got the angry students, we've got the uninformed students, we've got the critical students, uh, and we've got our fans out there, the, the sympathetic students. But for those first three, the, a human being's name, if, if anyone's ever taken the Dale Carnegie course and read things about uh, human behavior, the fav everybody's favorite word in the English language is their name. They like their name, and they love to hear their name said. So what I try to do, and I don't succeed every semester, is genuinely try to learn student names and the correct pronunciation. I've heard professors say, oh, well, it was close enough. That is, maybe the student doesn't say anything, but that is a horrible thing to do. Somebody's name, work at it, try to learn your student's name, and if they correct you, you know, take the correction with respect and do your best. I think if you're trying and you're trying to learn their names, it goes a long way. This has the students feeling more connected to the professor. If you don't know anyone's name and you, they're just a bunch of talking heads out there, you can still teach class. I'm just suggesting that this may be able to help you bridge the gap between you, the angry students, the critical students, and the, um... sorry, I'm gonna wait till the phone's done ring. So the angry students, the, the critical students, and the other ones that are just not so interested in what you, what you have to do. Now, the second suggestion, and again, we're talking about non-class related topics, share personal stories. And I'm not talking about, you know, a somber, very personal uh, you know, thing that you, if you feel compelled. I mean, I'll tell stories about being stuck in traffic or something that happened at the grocery store. And what I've learned from other professors, from judges, from other lawyers, just generally throughout my life, is people love to hear a story. You have to understand when you get up in front of a class, these students are generally, whether they would admit it or not, intimidated by you. You have a lot of knowledge. You've got an advanced education. You're super smart and you're up there about to teach them something. 
share a personal story, let them know that you are a human being. And what I would say on this uh, is don't make your personal stories touting how great you are. Everybody knows how great we are. You, you can flash the slides about the PhDs and the, the Juris Doctorates and everything. They get that. I'm talking about a personal story that shows you as a human being. So uh, that would be suggestion number two. The third one, students love this. When I send kids on break for uh, class, more than half the class stay, because I'll always bring up a question. Hey, you know what? I was trying to figure out this Instagram thing last week, and you know, have you guys ever used Instagram? And you should see them light up. First, the fact that this old guy is using Instagram, they get a kick out of that, but then they love to, to talk. So now I'm putting them in the role of teacher. And again, bridging the gap, trying to win over the angry students, the critical students, right? We're trying to win over those folks so that they're engaged. Because if a student is not engaged, you can be the best teacher in the world, but a student will not learn until they're ready to learn. And engagement is paving the way to help them learn. Uh, three and four, kind of same thing, just general chat with the group of students that remain on break. It, again, makes you a human being. It also helps them because I, I feel like students are very awkward on break, uh, the ones that don't go out and smoke or do whatever they do. And they want to relate to you beyond the pedigree. You know, they, they know that you're qualified. They know that you're smart. They want to know more about you. And they have this innate desire to go home and to tell their parents or their friends and their family about Professor Jones or Professor, you know, Michaels, whoever they're talking about, they want to go home and they want to tell stories. And every class after that first class, they're going home and you are either a he or a she for the rest of that night because they're going to be at the dinner table saying, and he said this and he did this. Oh, and he went to the grocery store and he, 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 she, she, she. So give them that opportunity to like you uh, and to become sympathetic students. The final thing is reference social media. Social media is taking the world by storm, and it has taken the world by storm. And I'm a little behind. I'm trying my best. But guys, I'll go on you know, the news, and I'll look something up about Facebook or Twitter or something that's trending, and then I will mention it in class. And they love it. Hey, double bonus. If you can find something going on in social media that has to do with your topic, wow, you've just won a huge victory. I will tell you that based on my experience, it seems that the overwhelming majority of younger students get their news from social media. So it's a great tool for us as professors to bring into the classroom, if not just to break the ice. Has anyone seen the picture on Instagram of the, the young boy who fell into the lion's den? or the gorilla's den. I mean, that was on that was on social media yesterday. And that's a great, for an ethics class, they ended up shooting the, the animal. That's a great segue for a conversation. But now 90% or more of my students have already seen that video and they're excited about it because it was on social media. So try to incorporate that and reference that uh, during your talks. Uh, what questions do you have about non-class related topics? Or let me say this, does anyone have any other suggestions that you could share with the group uh, of things you use to talk about with students for non-class related topics that may help bridge the gap or kind of get people in the learning mode. I'll take it because silence is no one is typing, no one wants to share, or that I've lost connection. Which one is it? Is anybody up there, Michelle? Uh, yeah, we've got several. Uh, no one's typing into the chat window. So if you want to continue, and then if you have uh, anything to share with the group, go ahead and type it into the chat window, and we can take a pause in just a, a couple minutes. Okay, and thanks for being patient with me, guys. I'm used to doing live presentations. I've never done one like this, so I'm staring at the computer. I have no idea what's going on out there. So uh, again, I appreciate your patience and flexibility with me. So we just talked about non-class related topics. This first one, is very, very important to me. And I think if you take anything away from this, um, you know, I'd really like you to take this. Always provide positive reinforcement and protection to every student that participates. Uh, most of us cannot remember the first time that we had to speak in class and raise our hand in front of a group of students that we don't know. And we were very nervous about it. Everybody knows that public speaking is the Number one fear in the world, obviously the folks on the phone and that are listening to this are the exception because I think most of us love to talk uh, in front of groups. But you got to think about the student. Some students will sit in your class for weeks 
And then they will finally muster up the courage to raise their hand and answer your question or to provide some input. And if you do not protect that student, you not give them the forum where they can actually speak. You don't want the student in the front row or there's always that one person who wants to talk over everybody. You are the person that owns that classroom. It's up to you to stop anybody from interrupting that student, to let them finish their thought. And if I'm honest with myself, the thoughts and the input are not always as add value as we want them to, but I always try to find some nugget in there to provide some sort of positive reinforcement. Why am I doing that? Because that student, based on that initial interaction, again, I do an entry level core course. If this is their first experience and they get crushed by the loud mouth next to them, or I belittle them in any way, shape or form, what's the likelihood of them participating again in the future? That was a rhetorical question. I, I, I think it's the, the answer is pretty obvious. It's gonna, if, they took, if it took them weeks to get the courage to speak and then their worst nightmare comes to fruition, they're probably not gonna do it again. And as professors, I think the learning in the classroom, and I know a lot of folks do online learning as well, but you know, learning from other students is also a big part of education. So by creating that channel, creating that safe environment where a student feels comfortable raising their hand and speaking, knowing that they're not gonna be ridiculed or cut off, I think is very, very important. The second thing, uh, this is tough. I, I try to force myself to do this, but you know, when you're teaching class, there's always a couple people who you know you can call on. They always have good answers. They always raise their hand. Uh, they're the sympathizers, right? And, and then they're good. They're good to call on. But they're the usual suspects. And I, I think you have to challenge yourself. That, that's the easy way to do things, right? Class flows. You get the right information. I, I think once in a while, you have to kind of look around, read students' faces, or if you're doing an online class, look for people that aren't participating and call them out in a way that's not gonna embarrass them, but ask them if they have anything to add. Let's, let's get away from the usual four or five people that always wanna input and give those other people the invitation. Just like number one, where, they're, where we're providing positive reinforcement, let's roll out the red carpet for them. Hey, John, I saw you, you know, flipping through the material and we were talking about this. Do you have any thoughts about this? What would you like to add, if anything? So I've done a couple things here. I've given them the opportunity to kind of shy away and say no, but I've also created a very nice red carpet for them to stroll in and share their opinion. And this is someone who may become a usual suspect at some point. Three, avoid straight lecture if possible. Look, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a lawyer. I don't prescribe to be a smart person. I, I think the mathematicians and all these, these science people that know all these details are the super smart people. And I know some disciplines require straight lecture. I'm not telling you to abandon your, your teaching method. Uh, you, know, you know your subject matter. All I'm asking you to do is to please challenge yourself. Remember, back in your collegiate years, when you were sitting in a classroom and you were dreading the next class because the professor talked the entire time and it was so boring and you were zoning out. Don't let it get to the point where they're zoning out. See if you can incorporate other things and bounce back to the lecture. If it's not possible, because the material you have requires straight lecture, by all means do it. All I ask you to do is have an open mind and challenge yourself. Uh, number four, ask students to explain their understanding rather than read aloud. Um, I'm not a big fan, and again, I'm not the end all be all here, but making a student read something, I'm not sure, I mean, it gets them maybe comfortable talking in class, so there's some certain add value components to it, but wouldn't it be better to say, hey, read this paragraph to yourselves, and then I'm gonna call on someone to please explain what they think that paragraph means. Or one of the things I often say in class is, please explain it to me as you would explain it to an eight-year-old. Because what students tend to do is they tend to read or take and extract the words and not synthesize it, not show understanding. So that's another tip, and I learned this from uh, one of the judges in Hillsborough, he, he teaches a lot of colleges and part-time, and he was telling me that he never lets the students read aloud because to him, he believes that that doesn't show anything other than their ability to read, and if they're a college, they should do that. So give that a try if you're not doing it already. Uh, if you're doing it, just challenge, if you're doing it to some extent, challenge yourself to incorporate it a little bit more, and eventually I would subscribe that 
you know, reading aloud be, be phased out, uh, if at all possible. Number five, this is a big one. Don't be afraid to leave the script. You know, people have been teaching for years and years and years, and you get in a routine. And I'll use myself for an example. Sometimes the book changes. I mean, the book has changed four or five times since I've started at St. Pete College. And I don't always update my presentation because I, I, I'm comfortable with what I'm doing and I'm not sure the changes are really relevant. But, you know, sometimes you have to leave this script and address a current event. And I guess the book example is probably not the best example. But what I'm saying is we all get into some sort of routine. I was going to use the word rut, but it's a much less favorable word. So I get into a routine. I would guess that most people uh, that teach do get in a routine. Sometimes things come up and you'll have students raise their hand and say, hey, professor, I saw in the news this, 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 and they want to talk about it. Well, I've been, I've, I've shadowed classes and I've seen people say, well, that's not for this week, let's talk about it next week. Or, you know, that's not part of the curriculum. You know, we're going to have to be journey out there. And maybe you don't know everything about the current event, so you're going to be a bit exposed. And the students are going to realize that you're human, and maybe you don't know every possible thing. Because believe you me, when they walk in that classroom, they look at you as the knower of everything. So don't be afraid to not know something, and don't be afraid to leave the script and address a current event. And what a great teaching tool. If something happens in the news or in social media, and it directly aligns to what you're trying to teach or the subject you're trying to teach, I think you're doing yourself a disservice by pushing it off to a later event. It's hot, I strike while the iron's hot. Everybody's thinking about it, everybody's talking about it. Get out of what your routine is, address it, and if you have to do something to recover next week some material that you missed, go ahead and do it. And then the last thing uh, for class related, reference social media. I know I said this a couple times and there, there probably will be future webinars and presentations, not from me, but from experts on social media. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you uh, something you already know. Students are on social media. When you let them go for break, uh, it actually bothers me sometimes because no one talks to each other unless I bring up the conference, start a conversation. They all stare at their phones. What are they doing? They're looking at Instagram. They're looking at YouTube. They're texting each other. So social media, if you can find a way to incorporate social media, even in the smallest way, into your presentations, into your teachings, I think it would go a long way. Uh, and I'm going to throw another just general question out there. And if, if you want to type, we can go over them later. I'm sure there are other things that other suggestions people would have uh, along the same lines. If you have any other tips or suggestions, you know, feel free to type them in. Um, you know, maybe we can update the presentation because I'm, I'm sure with all the years and years of experience and expertise on the phone, that there are other things that I missed, but these are the six that I came up with. All right, defendants exhibit C, the syllabus. The syllabus is very, very important. The components I see it as, it's the law, it's the roadmap, it's the instruction manual, and that's the part I hate, it's the administrative. Thankfully, the administrative part's easy because the school provides that for us. But the syllabus, people get online and they want to see their syllabus before they even meet you. It's important, the syllabus is a very important tool. So the first thing, to me, the law, people, I'm not sure, can we? All those questions should be answered. So the, the six things that I have in there, establish the rules of the class, manage behavior expectations, avoid petty rules. Uh, the grades are in there, unless these folks are independently wealthy and they're just doing it for the, the gratification of learning, these people want to grade. Uh, make it age and level appropriate. We talked about that earlier with communication. If they're not going to understand it, it's useless. And then be clear, I pasted what I do as far as class expectations and participation grade. So I remember when I was an undergrad, actually I went to St. Pete Junior College uh, back when the dinosaurs roamed. And a lot of times I'd look at the syllabus and it said there was a participation grade, but I didn't quite understand what it meant. So what I've done is pasted in here what I use for participation and for class expectations. So you can read that on your own. I'm not going to read it to you. But basically, the plus and the minus are things that I tell the students, these things have impact on your participation grade. And if you read the way I've written things in there, I try to eliminate any ambiguity. So when they're reading this, it's clear to them what the expectations are in class. And if people deviate from the expectations, I immediately will say, we went over the syllabus on day one, correct? 
and did you understand this part? And I'll reference to it. And then I'll say, okay, can we agree that going forward, we're gonna adhere pretty quickly. And I have gotten a lot of good feedback, which I'm proud of from students that say, he runs an adult class, adult conversations and some simple adult rules. I wish more classes were like this. So I'm asking these people to behave um, as considerate human beings, as adults, as not to hinder anybody else's learning. Uh, and then be clear, just, you know, especially with grades, students' biggest complaint to me over the years, and I've, I've tweaked my syllabus, I tried not to do the, the same thing all the time, uh, is grades. Like, how do I know what my grades are? Or how am I, how's my grade calculated? So I try to be as clear as possible with that. Uh, so the roadmap, this is the next component. Week by week, you know, if you want your students to be prepared, they have to know what's going on. And understand that students, some procrastinate, some wait until the 11th hour, some like to be ahead, some like to be four weeks ahead. So I try to lay out the syllabus. Obviously, there's some flexibility in there. I do it in a chronological learning order. Uh, I think that works for me. That has worked for my students. Uh, and I, I don't want to keep reiterating this, but I will. I'm not saying someone else's method is bad, because if you have a method and it works for you, go for it. I'm just saying that this has worked for me, and I actually learned this from several other people. Um, the key things, when assignments are due, what the important dates are, and be clear. One trick that I've incorporated over the years is I don't, make, I don't really take attendance, but if you look at the things that are in red on my syllabus, those indicate items that will be graded. So if the student doesn't come to class, I have no makeup quizzes in my class. I give them one, one free that gets dropped, but other than that, it's their obligation to come to class, and that expectation was managed up front. So almost every week, there is an opportunity uh, for them to earn points towards their final grade. And as stated earlier, unless they are independently wealthy and they are just super interested in ethics um, and doing it for their own edification, they want a good grade. So I have very good attendance, although I don't even take attendance because I'm giving them a perfect layout of what is due and when it's due. All right, the instruction manual. The worst experience I had in college was in my constitutional law class in, in law school. And I actually think Ben Franklin himself rose from the dead and was teaching that class. I never had any idea what was going on. Um, the, the professor never told us exactly what we were supposed to do. And let me rephrase that. This, the professor never even remotely told us what we were supposed to do. So we all seemed to run around um, in a mass state of confusion. And the course was horrible. If you looked at the syllabus, it was a couple paragraphs. You're gonna learn about constitutional law and the importance. There were things that were due, but there was very little explanation. And maybe that was appropriate. Maybe it, it did what he designed it to do. I don't know. But I suggest to you to have someone else read your syllabus. Just a random person. And when I say random, don't just approach someone on the street or on campus, but you know, someone that maybe doesn't teach or uh, someone that can be honest with you and that is impartial and has no, no dog in the fight. Let them look at it and ask them, hey, is this clear to you? And that's a good way. I've done that in the past, uh, shared it with uh, you know, other lawyers, people that don't teach. And it's amazing when you get someone outside the profession, they'll look at it and say, well, this doesn't make sense. What are you asking them to do? To explain the assignment is great. And ladies and gentlemen, this makes our job easier. If we're very clear on what the student is supposed to provide, we're going to get what we ask for, or we should. And that makes our grading easier. It, you know, it just makes everybody's life that much uh, easier. Attendance. I said I don't really have an attendance policy. Uh, but if you do, let's get it in there. Let's be clear about it. Participation grade. That's a great tool. You've all heard of the carrot and the stick, right? So, you, you know, the carrot uh, is the what you dangle for the, the, the person to chase after to motivate their behavior. And the stick is kind of the, the stick that's chasing them that's going to hit them if they don't behave the right way. Participation is a great carrot. If you follow these rules, you know, the participant grade, participation grade is uh, based on this. And sky's the limit. You, you can to put anything in your participation grade. So, you know, help them out when you say participation grade. What exactly are they supposed to do? 
And I subscribe to you that this helps you manage your classroom better. Uh, five and six, balance and, and, and be clear. So I'm going to leave this slide at this point. Have any questions popped up, Michelle? We have one. Laura is typing in a question right now. So Thank you, Laura, because I need to take a drink. Okay, Laura's question, but what do you do with the arguing students who still expect to be able to turn things in late, even though you said you say don't ask? So I, this is my own personal flavor to it, and I think you can do what you want, but I say, I go over the syllabus in the first class, and let me go back to that slide. I go over the part where it says there are no makeup quizzes, and then I look at everybody, and I say, I promise you, there is going to be at least one person in this class who's going to ask me for a makeup on a quiz that they missed. And what am I going to say? And the class laughs and they say no. And I say, and then I say, who's going to be the person that is going to ask me for a makeup quiz? And nobody raises their hand. So, you know, it's clear in there if they do come later on and say, hey, you know, I was out, you know, my, my dog got its nail clipped too far and I started bleeding and I had to call carpet cleaners or whatever the excuse is. Yeah, I tell them, I'm sorry. We drop one quiz. And I'm not making exceptions. And the whole word, word slippery slope, that theory, you can't make exceptions, guys. If you have an absolute rule that you're not going to accept makeup quizzes or you're not going to accept makeup or late assignments, you can't give on that at all. If you want to give on that, leave yourself some parameters. And that's the part about being clear. Uh, as much as I want to sometimes, I don't. And because that's, that's the rule I've, I put in there. So what I say to that question, which is a very good question, whatever rule you put in place, Make sure it's reasonable and that you're going to be able to adhere. Thank you for your question. So I had a chance to get a drink. All right, administrative stuff. You know, I'm sorry, Michelle, do you have something? Sorry, real quick. Uh, Laura had a follow up. Doesn't the college require makeups with doctor's note? That I don't know. I've never had anyone come in with a doctor's note, but. Um, if someone came in with a doctor's note, I would certainly uh, look at that. But I, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the, my my thought, and maybe this is just the lawyer in me, is well, what if they have some sort of affliction that keeps them out of class for eight weeks in a row? Uh, you know, does the doctor's note allow them the opportunity to still make up all the assignments? I, I'm just not sure, but I would have to look at the school policy. So that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Does anyone? on the phone know the answer? I know just I'm personally as an adjunct, I, I teach for one program. I'm sure every, everybody on here teaches for different programs, but it, it tends to vary by your discipline and your program. I know uh, certain chairs and deans handle that in one way, others handle it in a different. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm with Paul on this. I don't know if there's a college wide, there, there may be, but I know from just talking to different chairs and deans and program directors that um, it seems to be handled on a case-by-case -case or program-by-program -program basis. Okay, thank you. So, and th that's a good segue into the administrative stuff. So, you know, a, a lot of students, again, with the web and social media, I direct them to the links. I give them all the links in the syllabus, and I give them a general overview. If there's a question, we'll click on the link and we'll go through it. And the reality is, as an adjunct, I'm not an expert at all this stuff. And I have no problem you know, showing some humility and saying, guys and girls, I don't have the answer, but I can get one for you next week. That's much better than try to fumble through a bunch of things and, and come up with a, a half-baked answer uh, just to, to show that I, I know stuff. But the two things that are important are the ad drop and the refund policy. I think you got to know that going in. You have to know it going in because it's a pretty tight timeline. And I feel like I'm doing a disservice to my students if they're on the fence. Um, I think they need to know when they would be financially obligated at what point and what those deadlines are. So uh, everything else, I believe the school gives you, but you know, the one tip I would give you is please go to your first class and know 
what the drop ad dates are, or at least have the links. And then the attendance as well, because you know there may be some students that have other obligations. And if you have an attendance policy that's pretty strict, and it's going to put them in hot water, and it's going to be a conflict between their uh, obligations, you know, it, it's I think it's our duty as professors to help them set them up for success and, and to have that information with them. And I just noticed that there are important dates, so that would have to be changed in the slide. So I apologize for the spelling error there. All right, that is the, oh, the syllabus grading. This is a sample of what I do for the grading. And again, I took this from somebody. I don't even remember who I got it from. It's been so long and I've, I've massaged it. But if you read through that, I think you have access to these slides. This is something someone shared with me. Um, I use 90% of it, change a few things on my own. But the students know exactly what the assignments are. They know the exact weight of each grade. And then they know what they need to pass. And at the end of the semester, I, I've never had anyone argue and say they didn't know. I've had people debate and you know say, oh, I, I, I messed this up. But they, they take the onus of anything that they messed up because I've been 100% clear here. So with the grades, folks, these people want good grades. They want to pass the class. That's why they're coming to school. Make sure they're set up for success and they know exactly what the expectations are, exactly what they have to do to pass, and exactly what the threshold is. All right, Defendants Exhibit E, we're, we're coming in hot, sliding in the end here. So alternative resources beyond the book. This is kind of elementary, we all know this, but I think it goes, it, it's worth repeating. We learn in many different ways, visual, via reading and writing, auditory, and then I can barely pronounce this word on a good day, so hopefully it's a good day. Kinesthetic, I think that's a kinesthetic. Aesthetic was better. That, that fourth one is what we're talking about here. When I said earlier about engaging students, and you can see on the bottom in bold, learning begins when the student is ready, period. You can have six doctorates, four masters, a Juris Doctor. You can be the greatest teacher on the planet, but if that student comes in and that student is not ready to learn, it's just not going to work because you can deliver the message, but if they're not ready to receive it. So education happens when you deliver and the student receives it and understands it. The other thing, grades are not always reflective of student performance. I'm sure we could debate hours on that, but I, I would just uh, subscribe that the grading, be, be cautious with the grading uh, and figure out a way to create assignments and grades that are reflective of learning as opposed to just uh, good test takers. And that was, that was as fancy as I get for web graphics. All right, alternative resources. So cell phones, tablets, gadgets, and social media. There are apps out there, and I learned this when I gave this presentation, and I wish I had taken the person's name down for, to give them credit, but there are apps on cell phones where you can take surveys. Um, you, you can do certain things, and I, I don't remember the name. I think the young lady was going to email me, but cell phones and apps, every student's got a cell phone. You know, and, and if they don't, you can figure out something to to include them, because you certainly want to create exclusion. But cell phone apps, they're things that you can incorporate in your class. And I don't allow cell phones on uh, or use during class, but I'm talking about after class. If you're doing an assignment, go to app XYZ and do this. Or they, there's polls, there's a whole bunch of things. Kids are on their cell phones all day long, all night long. And if you want them to do something and you want them to become engaged and you want them to become sympathizers, give them an excuse to use their phone to, to do some schoolwork and they'll love it. Uh, same thing with tab tablets and social media. I'm not gonna talk anymore about social media. The internet, YouTube. I've seen a lot of professors using YouTube. This is a great tool. Again, they can see this on their phones. They can see it on their gadgets. And if you can find something that's uh, trending or whatever the, the, the chic term of the week is, you find something that's popular. And if you can somehow incorporate it into your lecture and add value into your subject matter, and you have just hit the jackpot. Uh, so another great tool, the internet. And then finally, student. Oops, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. We have two questions. Do you want to stop or do you want to finish this slide? And... Nope. What do you got? Um, Amy had a question. Do you encounter those students who don't turn their cell phones off during class? If so, how would you handle that situation? And then Alan followed up. Alan, why are you in red? Um, 
why would you not let them use their phones during class time if you used it as part of the lesson? So do you use the phones during the lesson? So the first question, I, I find if people are using cell phones, uh, I will stop the class and I will go over the rules again. And I will, I will call the person out and say, you know, Mr. Jones, I, I, we talked about cell phone use, haven't we? And usually when you do that once, it doesn't happen every class, but, you know, and I don't know how many of you are parents, but as a parent, I learned a long time ago, you've got to pick your balance, right? So if you're going to tell them no cell phone use, you got to stick to it. My first couple semesters, I didn't do that. And maybe this kind of lends itself to answering Alan's question, but they run amok. They're, they're Facebooking, they're Instagramming, they're, they're Twittering, uh, you know, they're playing games because you're seeing the back of the phones. So you don't know what they're doing. And there's a couple problems with that. One, I'm not trying to be the, um, I'm doing a Seinfeld uh, reference here. I'm not trying to be the phone Nazi, but it distracts other students. So if you're in a class and you see students using their cell phones, look at the students behind them. They're looking and they're losing interest in you while well, they're being distracted from the message that you're delivering or from what their peers are delivering because they're interested and they're distracted by someone else's cell phone use. So that was the long lawyery answer. The short answer is I just confront them as if I would confront someone about using a curse word in the class. I, I would just, you know, in a polite yet firm way, I would address it, tell them it's unacceptable and don't let it happen again. And as far as Alan, I, I think I kind of answered it. And if you have a good enough rapport and maybe it's with you know higher level classes, people can be more trusted. I, I just don't let them use it because I find it distracts the other students. It doesn't distract me, but I feel like the students you know that come prepared and that are paying for their education, if they wanna sit there and learn, I, I don't think I'm doing the right thing by letting the student in front of them be on their computer, you know, having Facebook videos or whatever up in front of them and distracting. Uh, so that would be my answer. Again, other people may be able to use it successfully in class. I just haven't been successful with it. Well, then Alan responded, um, making the cell phone a tool. And, and Alan's uh, in the instructional technology group with me. So making it a tool instead of a problem. And then he included a link to Socrative.com, which is a great resource. Um, there are many ways to use cell phones in manners that can be used with the lesson. So incorporating the cell phone use into the lesson rather than. Uh, yeah, I, I think that I think that's a great idea. And hopefully that link is shared with the folks on the phone and, you know, the folks in the webinar, because as mentioned, if I could figure out a way to have cell phones used throughout class where I didn't think it was distracting to the other students, I think it would be terrific. Uh, so maybe there's something I can learn on that link and, you know, maybe further develop, uh, you know, what I do. But I, I think it's a great point. All right. And then the final one I have there is students. Remember I talked about the sympathizers. Students learn from other students. And though we are all brilliant professors, uh, and we are, we all, we all know our, our stuff, we know our discipline. Sometimes a student hearing something from another student or having it explained a different way or being in a group with students and talking through the issue, sometimes that solidifies the learning. Sometimes it triggers that aha moment that they weren't getting when you know we were explaining it. Um, and sometimes you know they're not. If if they're people that are the angry student or the critical student, maybe they're more receptive to hear it from from a peer. So I try to use students a lot in class. And when I say use, I'm talking about very quick in class group exercises. We do case studies, and I you know have folks talk about that. So I like to have the message delivered from several different avenues. And I keep saying, I, please remember, this isn't something I invented. This is just, you know, a hodgepodge of things I've learned from other professors. So I think students are very, very powerful. And when you're creating groups, I offer that you, it may not be best to use the randomizer. It may be better to find your sympathizers and split them up. It's just this is what I try to do after the first couple of weeks, identify the students that are engaged, the front row sitters, the people that are pushing the envelope um, and want to learn. And I try to disseminate them throughout the rest of the class so that using them as, as a tool. Uh, other things that 
I, I've done, uh, I assign a fact checker for each class. So Alan, uh, and you've probably got some other good things to share with the group, but I let one person access the cell phone on occasion to check facts. So sometimes something will come up and someone doesn't know the exact answer or I'll come up with something random and I'm not sure it's 100% correct. I'll let someone get on Google while the class is still talking. And this is usually a reward to someone who is a front row sitter or a sympathizer and they check the facts and they verify what's been said. Uh, and often I am wrong, though I hate to admit that. Uh, you can create a class Facebook page. They have these super secret groups. Um, again, if you're going to do this, just classroom stuff only. I, I don't think we need Facebook anymore because the school provides a good forum uh, to communicate back and forth with students. But in the spirit of different sort of sorts of social media, I don't even know if students use Facebook anymore, but it, it seems we've done a couple super secret groups where people can only be added um, by invitation. And the one caveat with that is make make some sort of Facebook profile that is really innocuous. You can share some light stuff, but you don't want students in your life. So maybe that's not the best idea, but someone had suggested with that. Uh, remote answering, I know those are expensive, but to Alan's point, maybe with the cell phone in class, sometimes you can do the remote answering. That's a pretty cool thing. Kids seem to love that. Uh, Instagram apps, and then you know I would ask the, the group if there are any others that folks would suggest. Uh, yeah, so these just some of the things in the internet. YouTube is a great tool. CNN.com. I mean, any news source. Uh, you can embed them in the assignments. So you know, you can embed them in your syllabus. So again, with balance, trying to get students to do a variety of, of things. And I'm coming close to to time. So let me see how many slides I have left here. All right. So with the students. Recruit students as auxiliary teachers. I just wanted to repeat that again because it's so easy just to hit the randomizer and let the system provide groups. But you're in the classroom. You've got a you've got your finger on the pulse of what's going on in the class. And if you've got five or six students who really got it, I think it's a very helpful tool to spread those folks out. And I'm not saying make them sit in different seats, but when you do in class group assignments where you're setting up groups throughout a class, you got to mix those folks up because otherwise you've got a really lopsided imbalance of, of talents, and I don't think that breeds the best type of uh, learning environment. One other thing on this slide, application versus rote memorization. Any chance you can do that, I'm well aware that every discipline does not lend itself to that, but if you can stress assignments um, that make the student demonstrate their understanding as opposed to their ability to simply read something 10 times and then to regurgitate it, that I think is a superior a method of engaging students, one, and helping them learn. All right, so what I would close with, and then I'll just answer any other questions, is I normally start this presentation with a story. Um, it, it was about, well, I don't know, maybe three months ago, I went on a plane flight, and I had to go to Washington, D.C. on business, and I was reading a magazine, and they started talking about this company called Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing. And the, the article was about a specific guy. He worked in the R&D department. And I wish I had a fact check because I think, I think the article said it was like in the 70s, maybe mid 70s. And he stumbled across, uh, he was assigned to make some sort of adhesive to do something with one of these big mining trucks or, or tools or facilities. I don't know specifically what it needed, but it had to be one of those big, heavy duty, crazy glue type things. So, you know, he was a scientist and he was doing stuff and he made an error. And what came out of it was this weird kind of goopy stuff. And he went to his boss and he said, hey, you know what, I, I screwed up a little bit and I got this weird kind of goopy stuff and I, it's kind of sticky, but not sticky, but is there some use for it? And he's like, look, it's okay that you messed up. Just just go ahead and, and keep trying. And he said, but really, I think we can do something with this. It's unique. I've never seen anything like it. The boss said, I'm not mad at you. Just go back to work. This guy wouldn't give up. Uh, he told everybody he, he could. He went above his boss's head. Same thing. You know, we, we've always, we're not in the glue business, we're in the Minnesota, we're in the mining and manufacturing business. That's what we've always done. We don't need glue, we don't sell glue, we don't do anything with glue, so just give it up. He went to different seminars, he told colleagues about it, people in his field. So I want to say, eight or nine years later, uh, he started probably started to get some traction with this. And I would say that every single one of you on the phone or watching this webinar has at one point in time come in contact with a product by Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing, otherwise known as 3M. That little goopy glue stuff that he invented is the stuff that you find on the back 
of every 3M product, that, that stuff that allows it to stick but not stick and kind of sticky but, but not. So had Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing always did what they've always done and refused to change, I don't know if I'd be telling the story here today because they may not be in business. They certainly wouldn't be well known at this point. So with that, I would like to thank you guys for the time. Thanks really for the patience and flexibility. I don't know how this came out on your end. I'm doing my best here staring at a computer talking to Defendant's Exhibit E. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, please type them in. I'll do my best to, to answer. And if you have any uh, follow-ups or want to email or anything like that, or most importantly, if you have any tips you want to share so I can enhance this presentation if I ever do it again, and maybe we can add it so it's in the repository for folks to use, that would be great. Are you still there, Michelle?